So again, today, uh, hepatitis C, we're talking about uh, can't do it without that community collaboration. So this is the perfect place to give this talk. So again, welcome. Are you going to talk? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the December 20th, which is next week. Already. Already. Uh, we're having no echo and we're having not having it two days after Christmas. So when we come back, we have Leslie Hayes. She's actually from New Mexico. She's going to be giving a talk on that day. And uh, I don't think she sent us exactly what she's doing, but got a lot of really interesting things coming back. So we have Catherine Justice coming back as well. Another great talk. And we'll, So get your yoga in before she comes back. All right, next slide. So there is free CME offered with these sessions with the caveat that we want you to turn your cameras on so we can see what you're eating for lunch. <laughs> yeah, Jesse wants to see people's faces, so don't be afraid to turn it on. Uh, but remember, when she sends you that stuff, fill it out, you get the free CME. There is um, technical assistance offered also. So if you need any help or assistance, um, feel free to get a hold of us. Our contact information is at the bottom of the slide. Yeah, not personal problems, please. Just regular medical stuff. <laughs> Next slide. And remember, if you want to go to the Center for Opioid Resources, you can get any of the information that you're looking for on different protocols, hospital stuff, all kinds of things that we have done over the years. Some of it useful, maybe some of it not so much, but. Lots of good info. So, and this is our speaker from Hennepin, Jesse Powell. He does this kind of stuff for a living, and we are just dying to hear your story. And so if you want to tell a little bit about yourself and then uh, and then kind of move on to the topic, that'd be great. Yeah, for sure. I'll put my slides up quick. And... You're starting with the end. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, he's <laughs> flip everything around here. There we go. Great. Yeah. So I'm Jesse Paul. I'm a physician assistant here and in, in and healthcare. And I work in the GI liver department here and specialize in hepatology. And I have a real big focus on viral hepatology, in particular hep C and community outreach and doing work to kind of um, decrease disparity for hepatitis C treatment access. Um, we do that in a variety of ways here. Um, right now we have a, a grant in partnership with MDH to do um, not only an ECHO that's kind of looking to bring community into it. So um, you guys know ECHO well is actually developed for hepatitis C and it's like a genesis down in New Mexico. Um, and it was there to treat providers how to treat hepatitis C. But as we'll talk through this, this talk and as I as Hep C has evolved, it's become very clear that it's much it needs to be, even though we need to decentralize care, we also need to incorporate non-treaters into this um, equation to better you know, access patients. We have SSPs doing screening. We need them to be able, we need to help them link to care in the community. So we need to, we do need complete co community collaboration around this if we want to be able to identify and like and decrease this epidemic. So we'll kind of go through that. And then we also do a lot of grant work um, with like screening and outreach work. Um, we're actively trying to develop more of a street medicine plan so we can be out in the community doing this treatment you know, alongside our SSPs and other people in the community there. That's kind of me in a nutshell and what my passion is. So this talk will be about like hepatitis C elimination. There's kind of plans that we're working on actually on part of a, a meeting later on today will be our inaugural meeting with the Department of Health on our developing our hep C elimination plan for the state. So um, this will be a central focus of mine is trying to get addiction medicine um, providers uh, engaged in this because I think it's um, imperative for you guys to to be a part of hep C treatment. Um, to kind of go through that, uh, my objections will our object, objectives will be to recognize the importance of addiction medicine and participation in any Hep C elimination plan, demonstrate the unique ability for community partners to impact Hep C treatment uptake, and then kind of provide you with maybe potential structure um, for how to integrate this Hep C, kind of hepatitis C treatment into your practice, and in a way that it's and kind of like easier worries because it's really it's very simple and easy to do. Compared to the other things you're doing, this is like probably the easiest thing you could do for your patients. 
So Hep C epidemic, why I'm so focused or why I, I'm so enga- trying to engage addiction services is because this epidemic is tied so tightly to drug use now. Unsafe um, injection drug use practices is the number one reason um, for acute infections right now and um, why you guys are at the heart of any true hepatitis C elimination plan. And just to kind of highlight that, as you look at this chart from the CDC, when they're able to identify a risk for any of the new for the new acute infections as of 2020, by far and away, injection drug use was the most identified risk by you know tenfold. So um, this is really you know the, the main main mode for our, our new infections for Hep C right now. And just kind of going further and kind of looking at you know, hep C and people who, who use injection drugs. We This is, uh, again, from the CDC, we've seen rates of acute hepatitis C double since 2013. Um, and then, you know, just with between like 2019 to 2010, it's gone up like by 19%. The, the orange line doesn't look as dramatic as the blue boxes because acute infection, uh, that's the reported acute infections means someone was sick. Um, and most people that get acute infection with hep C don't even know they had it, or they may have like really mild symptoms. So they don't, you know, go to the doctor and get checked. So either they're sick in the hospital with like jaundice and myalgias, arthralgias, and true viral like um, prodromal s- symptoms, or you just randomly are testing and catch an acute infection. So we know that this is dramatically the underreported if, you know, just to go by the those cases and we project like what the actual estimated acute infections will be based on on the numbers of acute infections that were reported. So blue box is much more showing like the, much, the more accurate amount of hep C that's new cases each year in the country. So exceeding 60,000 cases per year as of 2020. Um, and we know that it is, you know, people who inject drugs have the highest rates and some studies can show up to 90% infectivity rates amongst populations. This is super heterogeneous. It's like, you know, I've seen studies where they screen maybe at like Skid Row and um, and uh, LA and the, the rates are extremely high, like 90%, but you could test in a different group, maybe in a, you know, in a, in a less populated state or something and the rates would be lower. Um, we've done from our screening work that we've done in the past here, and like in Minneapolis area, it's around 20% is what we can like kind of routinely see as like our positivity rate. So, um, but just to kind of highlight how heterogeneous it is and how how inf- how highly infectious some populations can be with hepatitis C. And then despite all these fantastic drugs and treatments and cures and all these things, people who are using drugs still are accessing care super at a super low rate, 20%. I, you know, studies from 2019 might seem old, but I think this is this, this not changed. We still struggle with this problem today. This just highlights more that it's been an ongoing issue for many, many years, and it's just, it needs to be addressed. We need to find different ways for people who are using drugs to access care for hepatitis C treatment. When we look at acute cases, this kind of goes along with the idea of injection drugs now being the most common route for acute infections. So we see our age groups, you know, 20s through um, 40s really being the highest groups um, affected or coming up with acute infections. They think that this little kind of dip in the younger people is probably just around COVID and just not accessing care and getting testing is probably not truly decreasing. And then we've kind of talked about, um, you know, U.S data so far, but in Minnesota, the trends are very much the same as what we see in, in the U.S. and um, in Minnesota as of, you know, the last the end of 2022, we had close to, you know, 33,000 patients or people with infected with hep C that we know about. I think a good number here too to remember is just like acute infections, chronic infections are under diagnosed still. So we think close to 50% of people don't even know they have the infection. So it could be much higher rate that we actually have of chronic infection in the state as well. Here are acute cases. Again, you see a trending upward of acute cases despite all our fantastic treatments. We're still gain, we're still increasing the number of new infections every year. The state also thinks this dip is not true. It's just COVID stuff where people weren't getting tested as frequently. And I really like this 
graph, it it's just kind of shows like how acute these are all acute infections by age group through the years. So as you can see, these high peaks back in like the early 2000s were our baby boomers, and they were really just the people that we were finding with hep C. So, you know, the vast predominance. And you can watch this a number of acute cases trend down until finally in the like 2020, 2022 numbers, they're actually lower. Now we're identifying more patients that are younger acutely, just another way of kind of looking at how the age paradigm has shifted for, for hepatitis C. So we've identified this is a big problem. There's a lot of people that have hepatitis C. Uh, a lot of people that are using drugs have hepatitis C. But why is it important to treat hepatitis C or what's the big deal about it? Uh, it's a, a major cause of death and morbidity. Um, and the deaths attributed to hep C in 2021 for a country are around 14,000, which is around three per 100,000 people. In Minnesota, we had 212 deaths that year, um, and still in close to that average of three per 100,000 too. I think it's important to know that we do have a, a pretty significant drop in deaths right now. And that's because we were able to, like when we look at, you know, these curves and uh, treat these baby boomers very well, we identified them and they were, you know, they, you know, tended to have, you know, insurance and were accessing their health care and they were really avid, you know, able to get treated. And we were able to decrease the prevalence of that age group pretty significantly. And as they aged, you know, we were able to you know, stop the progression of their liver disease. But if you think that this group is growing over here, they're young, they haven't had it very long, they're going to become, you know, they're going to age if we don't, if uptake is only 20% or less, if we don't treat them, they're going to age and develop, you know, um, advanced liver disease and liver cancers and this death rate is just going to go back up again. So it's great that we're, we've accomplished this, but if we don't address this growing trend in our young population, um, we're going to be back in the same boat with deaths in, a, you know, 10, 15 years. So what does Minnesota look like as far as like outcomes? We're kind of middle of the road in that, you know, we're like 2.75 per 100,000. So we're right in the middle of like deaths. So not the worst, but not the best either. Um, I, this is really important to me too, because I think you know, it's horrible, like, Cirrhosis is horrible. We get jaundice, you get ascites, you get these bleeding varices or liver cancer, end up needing liver transplants or dying from this. But, you know, there's people that maybe don't get advanced disease from hep C, but they can have lots of other extra hepatic manifestations of this disorder. We see diabetes linked to hepatitis C, difficult to manage diabetes. Um, so we see blood cancers like non-Hodgkin's B, B cell lymphomas, kidney diseases, skin disorders like like in planus, such as just really annoying to like horrible things like porphyria, cutane, tarde, which are like blood blisters on sun-exposed areas of the skin. There's associations with hyperlipidemia, fatty liver, so secondary liver diseases, especially with our genotype three patients, which are uh, the growing genotype amongst our IV drug users as well. So we're seeing more genotype three, which has a more rapid progression to cirrhosis and also an association with hepatic steatosis or fatty liver. So lots of things that even if you don't get cirrhosis could really impact your, you know, your quality of life or even mortality rates with like cancers and different things. So really important to treat even if they're not progressing. So now we know it's really bad to have it and it can cause really bad things. Why people, why are people accessing care? And I think this study was really, really looked at like people that use drugs and what their what how their experiences with the healthcare system, like our, our conventional healthcare system. And when you see this, it's pretty disheartening. 78% had at least one stigmatizing event during a healthcare visit. Um, 72 percent reported some kind of enacted like discrimination or dismissive attitudes when they go to the hospital or clinics um, and nearly 60 percent expressed fear of just being stigmatized or discriminate discriminated against because they um, have this kind of label of like using drugs or whatever um, but I think the silver lining to the study showed that you know nearly 63 percent reported a positive, outcome or experience when they were treated in, in, for their medical care through like SSP. So I think that translates to like addiction clinics or anyone that's kind of like, you know, working with them 
in the community because they just feel more comfortable. They're not stigmatized. They're not treated differently. And it's, you know, it's hard for me coming from a big institution to know that this is a, probably happening to my patients at other clinics. We can we can be as, you know, open, non-judgmental as we want at our liver clinic. But if they're accessing healthcare for primary care, other things are going to the ER here and being treated, you know, in a disrespectful way, it's going to translate to what they assume is going to happen when they come to see me. And they're not, that means they're not going to come see me. You know, so I think this means that this is just another point as to why we need to decentralize care and let people access care where they feel comfortable and are going to be treated um, differently. So kind of like looking at where that could be or who's kind of in who is involved in hepatitis C care, and there are maybe not even in the hepatitis C care, but just seeing people that have hep C, these, these people are kind of frequently coming through these places. So there's, these are just my silos that I, I kind of came up with and, you know, syringe services and addiction treatments, kind of what we're focusing on the day, but there's other places that are in and out and around hep C, we like corrections and the county health departments like Red Door Clinic here, community, other community clinics, specialty care clinics, homeless shelters, mental health services, HIV services, all these people are seeing patients that are at high risk for having a hepatitis C infection. So another way of looking at that is we're all dipping into hepatitis C, um, or, you know, in some form or another. Some of these places may be doing screening only. Some may be doing treatment. Some may be doing nothing. Who knows? You know, they just, these people are just kind of accessing resources at their location or something. So what we need to look at is how do we link care? How do we kind of work together? And it doesn't mean we, like every time I start someone, I have to call everyone in the circle and tell them that so-and-so started hep C treatment. It's just like having everyone on the same page that we want to cure hepatitis C from patients. We want to, this is going to be a priority for us for these patients. And knowing that if I start someone and they fall out of care, but they end up over at like healthcare for the homeless in Ramsey County, someone's going to know like, oh, they are in hep C treatment. I'm going to make sure that they do their labs and get tested or, or make sure they get cured or encourage them to, you know, help them make sure they get their next refill. Or if they end up in corrections, we're able to continue treatment because someone's there, you know, understanding that this medicines are important. I need to stay on them. So just all these different people just participating in the, in the care and, at, and ensuring like ongoing, like, treatment for patients that are started or looking to start treatment. And it's also getting to know each other too, right? I mean, if I know someone over like at NAC that I can call and I, I feel comfortable, if I, you know, you're more likely to reach out and help bridge care for people, get people connected to places to get care. So getting to know each other, knowing who the advocates are in each of these, all our organizations, what everyone's doing will just help improve that network of care and like that access to that, that, that kind of spider web of like care so people don't fall through it. One thing I think is really interesting about addiction services is you could take this bubble, it looks like the, H, the hep, HIV or hep C, sorry, bubble, but all these other services are in, interacting with addiction services a lot of times. So again, another way of looking at why addiction is so uniquely positioned to really make a dramatic effect on like hepatitis C um, prevalence and like working on, you know, the, on our, on our elimination plan, because all these places, no other bubble really interacts with everyone else in, in some way, as much as I think the addiction services do. So um, just highlighting how important I think it is that you guys are, are interested in hepatitis C treatment and take it on. Because truly just adding hepatitis C treatment to what you're already doing will decrease prevalence without a doubt. We've seen that in other studies. We've seen that in other countries that have like taken up this kind of models of co-located treatments, Australia, like um, Iceland, uh, like a lot of the European countries have been able to either basically eliminate hep C or decrease dramatically their prevalence through like co-location of like these cares. So it will, this will happen for us too, if we can, if we can accomplish this goal. So it's not just like, hey, do treatment and then everything's going to be fine. There's lots of other things that have to happen here. Like we need to work as a community to improve processes and access to treatment for groups. So some of that like process stuff would be improved screening. I think, you know, I don't, 
I don't know about you guys, like, you know, in all your different spots, but, um, you know, I, around around the community that I work with, screening isn't necessarily the biggest problem. It's linkage to care, I think. So they do a lot of pop-up screenings and like the, the mobile SSPs are doing screenings and different things and they find people, but then they just kind of tell them they have hep C and that's kind of where it ends. There's no real like, you know, next step to get on treatment or even get that PCR lab to confirm that they have chronic infection even. So really need to, you know, still can ramp up screening. We could do things like, you know, ensuring we're doing the, if you're doing an antibody blood, like venous poke, that you're doing the reflex PCR to simplify the follow-up testing. There's blood spot testing that I don't think we've utilized here in the cities, but there's a guy out in the Oregon, Dr. Seaman, that really talks about using this. And it's like a you do it out in the field. So you get a blood spot and you take it back to the lab and do antibody and PCR testing all at once. So it's kind of a novel idea. Um, but linkage to care is really huge. I think developing these co-located clinics will definitely help with linkage to care um, and probably increase prescriptions because if we can get more people in the clinic, we're going to get more prescriptions. And then, you know, any plan has to have harm reduction because it doesn't end with just treating people. They need to understand they can get reinfected, needed to provide them with safe needles and syringe services and PrEP and all those other things to help protect them. And then, you know, improving access to treatment for our at-risk groups and like people that are using drugs, unhoused, prisons, our indigenous communities, mental health. These are all high, 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 high risk patients for hepatitis C. Um, and we need to make sure that we're adequately offering them treatment. So one way to improve access, you know, is low barrier access. So like in testing, so, you know, walk-in clinics are easy access clinics that can be, that have to happen through like engagement of non-specialists in the treatment of hep C too, right? So this is what we're talking about today, like getting a primary care addiction specialists, other people engaged in like doing this treatment and decentralizing that care and bringing that care to their clinics in the community. And that would result in you know better screening and also linkage to care and treatment. This would be this is the holy grail. This is not available yet, but I think what we need to you know some of the things we need to work on maybe as a as as a team and some things we already are doing. Um, rapid testing with confirmation RNA isn't available in the U.S., but it should be coming soon. It's available in the in Europe, and they're doing like FDA. Um, um, trials on these units. So eventually we'll be able to do rapid testing with confirmation in the field. Um, we do already have like simplified treatments with minimal to no labs, short duration, uh, affecting all the genotypes. You don't need special meds for each genotype. What we need to work on are getting rid of the prior authorizations for treatment because that's a huge barrier um, requiring that lengthy paperwork and, and time to submit those things and then treatment and acute infection. So these things we can modify. We're actually actively working on it. Many of you might have received the letter that we've already started that draft to fight uh, Minnesota Medicaid on getting like approval RPA off like off the table for Hep C drugs, so they don't need it anymore. Um, if 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 you haven't, um, I can get we can definitely send you that letter to sign it. We've got like 300 plus people signing that letter now. We'll take it to the to the state to try and uh, get rid of that that boundary. And I think, you know, doing those things are going to really, you know, allow us to streamline care in, in different places and, and achieve that cure that we're looking for. So where can we improve? It's like sounds dramatic, but it really, we're, the only thing I think we do fairly decent right now in the state is like we, we screen okay. And where people are doing that okay, but we break down all these other places and I kind of you know, the linkage to care, even just from after point of care testing, the confirmatory testing is an obstacle. After confirmatory testing, getting people to get treatment is an obstacle. Any on treatments an obstacle. Follow-ups after treatments an obstacle. And a lot of that's because it's being done at brick and mortar clinics, hepatology specialist clinics and places where it's just is hard for people to navigate. And uh, looking at that, we're talking about, you know, these advantages of co-location of clinics. When we think about conventional treatment through our centralized hepatology clinics like the one I work in, it's a big system that's difficult to, to navigate for many people. There's tra transportation issues. We talked about, like, the mistrust and stigma that many of these, like, groups like, experience when they come to big centers like this. 
And they may end up needing, you know, if they need addiction services, they need primary care, they need to come to me, they have multiple visits, which in a, a co-located clinic could be done all in one visit. Instead, they have to do multiple visits when they come to have treatment with me. Telemedicine is a is a potential tool, but it can also be a barrier when you require that as the only way, um, because that can prolong the time to treatment and initiation. It can make things difficult. If you're trying to treat unhoused or, or people you know that are using, they might not have great access to high speed internet or smartphones or you know minutes to do these things. So that may be a barrier just for certain patient groups to be able to access that kind of technology. Um, but if you are, you know, if it's the only thing in, in, that you have, I mean, it's the best thing you can do. I, you know, so it's a, it can be a tool in that way. And if right now with like some of our like um, prior auth requirements, like if they have cirrhosis or prior treatment, they need a specialist like opinion. So something like telemedicine to get that is like is a very is valuable for sure. Um, but otherwise, I've been hoping that people will take up the treatment of it, so we don't need to worry about telemedicine as much as a as a as a use for Hep C treatment. But when you co-locate these, you know, obviously we're streamlining care, right? Because they're taking multiple visits down to one. They're doing it in a place that they trust with a provider that they trust. And through this has been documented in many studies as well. Like doing that always improves the ability for people to start and complete their therapies correctly. So. A lot of this is already known. I mean, I think it's just, you know, actioning those items. So what does treatment look like? It really isn't that complicated. It is super simple, people. <laughs> like, it is, it really will be one of the easier things that you do every day if you, you treat a hep C patient every now and then. I'm going to start from the beginning, just looking at what you do for hep C for screening through, like, treatment. But really, screening is just, now it's anyone that's 18 or older should get a one-off test. If they're under 18, but they have risk factors, you should certainly can test them earlier. Like if their mom, they're born to a hep C positive mom or if they're using drugs or something, I mean, obviously you can test them earlier. Uh, perinatal, we recommend testing with each pregnancy and then, you know, repeat testing if someone's, you know, has a risk of exposure and at least annually if someone is like using injection drugs or if it's an HIV infected man who's using, having unprotected sex with other men. Or on prep, we recommend annual screening for those individuals as well. What do we use for screening? Um, you can do, you know, if it's in office and you do the antibody test, just remember always get the PCR reflex one, so you don't have to have them come back for a second blood draw to confirm um, hepatitis C infection. Um, you can use that point of care test um, out in the community, and then like, you know, it is great. But if you um, I wouldn't recommend using the point of care testing clinic if you can get away from it. And then um, if, you, if you're testing someone that you think is acutely infected um, and it's negative, you should repeat it again in six months just to make sure it wasn't too early in the testing. Um, and then if someone is um, immunocompromised, like if they did have like, um, especially like AIDS, if they were like untreated HIV or if they were like maybe, you know, organ transplant recipient, even when they're exposed, they may not develop antibodies. So you could use PCR testing for screening and on those patients if you wanted to, which probably be a good idea. Um, you know, if people were positive for their antibody and they cleared it, so kind of maybe a step back just so people understand, like when you're when you're exposed to Hep C, you go through a phase of acute infection that's typically around six months. And then either, and in that period of time, either you clear it about 90% or, or about 20 to 40% of the time people will clear it and they will just like, they won't have chronic infection or they won't have chronic infection. Like, you can clear after six months. Some people, it's about 90, if you're going to clear, it's about 90% of the time you'll clear within that six month window, but some people will take up to a year or longer to clear but they kind of use that marker. So if someone, if you test someone in their positive antibody, but they cleared the virus, like their PCR is negative, never use the antibody test then to rescreen for, for like new infection, because it's going to be positive forever, right? So this test will always be positive. Same if we like treat someone for hepatitis C and they're cured now, but they're still using and you want to check to make sure they're not reinfected. You always have to use that, that PCR, the hep C RNA testing to, to look for new infection. Um, we always get that in, you know, right before treatment. It's always good to know what the viral level is prior to starting your treatment. 
there are genotypes or different strains of hepatitis C. There's like six, one through six are the main ones. You don't really need this for treatment, especially acute non-serotic or, or new non-serotic treatment naive patients. Um, but it, you know, if someone's been retreated or the treatment didn't work or if they have cirrhosis, um, there might be times where we want to know what it is. And right now our insurance like Medicaid's plans require it for some reason. So we end up getting it all the time anyway. Um, just another way of looking at how you can manage this test. So if someone gets their antibody test and it's non-reactive, they don't have hepatitis C. Remember the caveat would be like if they're immunosuppressed or if it's really acute infection, they maybe repeat it or try a PCR just to be sure. Um, if their antibody is reactive, you do the RNA. If the RNA is not detected, they don't have current infection. And then you would just like repeat PCR if they have ongoing risks for new infection every year. Um, and then if they have positive PCR, they have current infection, and then those are the people who really need to concentrate on linking the care to get treatment. So who do we treat? Pretty much anyone, like almost everyone that you're gonna see in clinic is gonna be someone that's a candidate for treatment. They're not, there's very, the the win, the, the, the group that we're, we say don't treat are those that have like a short life expectancy that wouldn't be remediated by the actual hepatitis C treatment itself, liver transplant or other directed therapies like for their liver cancer. I mean, if you got into those patients that are pretty advanced or have lots of liver disease, it'd probably be best to have them see like a, ex, like a hepatologist for that anyway. But all these treatment naive young guy, young people that we're seeing predominantly that haven't had it for a long time, they don't have cirrhosis, they don't have like, you know, bad liver disease, or they're going to be these easy to treat patients that um, we'd want you guys to focus on. So there's a simplified guideline through the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. I'm just going to show you the non serotic patient ones because it's really straightforward. So here, these are the people that wouldn't qualify for that. So it's without cirrhosis. So obviously people that have cirrhosis wouldn't qualify for this. If they've had prior hepatitis C treatment, in particular, like if they've been on like a direct acting antiviral before, if they were on like the really old stuff like interferon, it wouldn't be a problem. But if they had any of the newer medicines, we should, uh, you know, they should be seen by a specialist maybe, or at least have a consult with them. If they have hepatitis B, if they're currently pregnant, they have liver cancer, or they think they might have liver cancer, or they had transplant. So those are the people that wouldn't qualify. Again, not a, not a lot of these people are gonna be other than maybe pregnancy, maybe, you know, would be like you might see, you know, not infrequently with like hep C in the younger, as the population becomes younger and younger, um, but the other people not, not, not likely, to be the people you're seeing with hep C. So what do we do first? You just you know, make sure they don't have cirrhosis. You can do that through non-invasive things like a FIB4 score, so it's super easy. It's just basic labs. It's uh, you know the patient's age, ALT, AST, and platelets, that's it. They, you Google the calculator, put it in, it gives you a score. Um, if it's under, oh gosh, we should remember this, 1.45, I think it's like no cirrhosis, and if it's over 3.25, they have cirrhosis. So you can kind of use that as a basic judge if they have cirrhosis or not. Um, if FibroScan is like an ultrasound guided tool um, that would predict how much scarring is in the liver. So if you have access to that kind of technology, that's great. Um, and then you can even use simple things like a play count and then looking at ultrasound if they have like a lumpy, bumpy liver, splenomegaly, things that would kind of go along with cirrhosis. You can use that to you know, identify it. Look at their meds, reconcile, make sure you know what they're taking both prescribed and like herbal or, you know, um, or, you know, supplementation stuff. And then you can use this Liverpool drug interactor checker and you put in what hep C drug you want and then you pop in whatever meds you're worried about and it'll let you know if there's any uh, interactions there. There aren't a lot of really bad interactions. There are things like, um, you know, like some of the um, statins will, you might have to dose reduce or switch. Uh, PPIs with one of the meds can be I like have to dose around it. Um, some of this um, anti-convulsants can be a problem. And then the big like one would be amiodarone, which not that many people use, but would be it's really hard to treat people if they have you know, those. But most of them are easily adjusted. It's just like the seizure meds and like amiodarone that are kind of hard because if someone's as well-controlled seizures and then you're messing with their regimen, that's always a little bit concerning. But again, not a 
not a big risk you know, thing that you're going to come across. But so for the most part, most med interactions are easily uh, modified um, or amended, but um, rarely there's a few that we have to worry about. And then just give them their education. It's really easy to take, but just tell them how to take it. Um, I'll show you which meds to use in a second. And then, you know, importance of adherence and, and, and adherence really, I mean, you don't have to be perfect. If they're not perfect, it's not that, not the end of the world. I, if they're even like 80%, like on time, like their cure rates don't really drop below 90%. So you can, I've had many patients over the years only take like half of the regimen and get cured. It's like, it's, these drugs are super powerful. We don't obviously advocate for doing it poorly, but just keep going. If people are not doing so well, just keep them on it. I mean, if it takes them a little bit longer to do it, they still have like better than 50, 50% a chance of cure if they finish up that treatment. Like many times it's still above 80%, even with pretty bad ad adherence, like by our standards. So really forgiving drugs are very powerful. Just get them through it. And they'll probably be able to manage a cure. And then reinfection re re prevention is kind of harm reduction strategies and things we've been talking about. You know, we need to reinforce as after they finish their treatment. So what do we get before labs? CBC liver panel, check their kidney function, um, sometime before treatment, PCR, HIV, Hep B screening, and then right before, make sure that they're not pregnant and counsel them on not becoming pregnant during treatment. It's not super important. I think there's like some studies coming out hopefully pretty soon that will show that like you can treat safely in pregnancy, but for now we try to avoid that. Um, but there's some early data with like, at least like Eplusa, one of the regimens we use that it's pretty safe to, there's been totally safe in pregnancy, no birth defects or anything. And these, these are again, like guidelines from ASLD, not what the state requires. So um, this is pretty accurate for like, Anytime, actually, just any time in the last year, they probably won't care if you get CBC, liver panel, and kidney function. They actually want with, with, within six months Hep C testing, RNA testing, HIV, and Hep B screening. And they want, I think, with Hep B, the, the surface antigen it, that's you know tells you if they have chronic infection or not. But you really should be checking a surface antibody and a core total antibody, like all three of those labs for Hep B screening. Um, so I would just add, then the state will probably require all those two from you. So I would get all three of those testing, those tests and in practice. So these are the regimens we use. Um, Maverick, Glucapavir, Pibrentisvir is a three tablet once a day with food for eight weeks regimen. And Sofosavir, Valpatisvir is Epclusa. It's a once a tablet a day with or without food for 12 weeks. Both are extremely like same efficacy, like 98% or more if you take the pills. Um, and then side effect profiles, basically the same. They're super mild, maybe a little headache, fatigue, GI upset. It's kind of like 10, 20% of people will have something like that at the beginning of therapy, normally resolves like after a week or so. And um, like, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I've maybe had one person stop because they couldn't tolerate the treatment overall like super super well tolerated most people a lot of people actually feel better because like fatigue like while it might be a side effect a lot of times it's like people with hep c that's like the one thing they have is fatigue and they don't even sometimes realize how fatigued they are and they'll start the treatment they'll come back to me and be like i feel so much better now that i'm on this medicine so i mean i think that if anything i hear just as much people feeling better on it than they have like having a side effect and then on treatment monitoring is like a piece of cake. There's like there's actually nothing you have to do for a lot of patients. You have to do any labs. You don't have to see them in clinic if you don't want to. All you have to do is like after they're done with treatment, check a liver panel and like a PCR at three months post treatment. So on treatment, no no labs required, no visits required. If they have diabetes, remember though they could have improvement in their. Um, um, management, so they might become hypoglycemic. So you just might want to monitor uh, their glucose a little bit closer while they're on treatment to see if their diabetes improves. And if they're on Coumadin, Warfarin could uh, um, decrease, so their INR might become subtherapeutic. And I've done, a lot, I've treated a lot of people on Warfarin, I haven't really noticed much of a change in INR, but um, it's possible, I suppose. So just, just to be aware of. And then when they're done with treatment, SVR means a sustained viral response. So three months after you finish treatment, you check to make sure they're cured. If you check right at the end of treatment and it's negative, it's like that 90% are going to be cured. But you got to make sure that that one, that 2% where it comes back. So we wait three months and check. 
Um, and then you always do a liver panel too to make sure their liver tests normalized because if they're cured and their liver tests are still elevated, they may have like that fatty liver that we talked about um, or some other liver uh, underlying liver disease that wasn't apparent due to their hepatitis C infection that you need to either work up yourself or get off to a specialist to figure out. Um, in practice, I do a lot of like end of treatment labs, like they check their PCR and liver panel right at the end of treatment because I um, see a lot. I, that three months window is a big window for people not showing up ever again. <laughs> a lot of loss to follow up during that time. So I, at least if I know that they're negative at the end of treatment, it's like they're probably cured. Like we got 98% chance that they're not infected anymore. Um, I haven't had someone come back with like, you know, we're a treatment failure in years, probably. It's just, um, so it doesn't happen very often. So if I know they did the treatment, at least pretty decent and like they were negative at the end of treatment I can feel good about it even if they don't come back um and then follow up aftercare really don't like if they don't have cirrhosis and they're not like actively using or at risk for reinfection you don't have to do anything if there's some risk for reinfection you want to check that remember that check that pcr not the antibody and maybe a liver panel at least once a year to see if they're elevated or, or if they got reinfected so just the uh, i a little schematic on what it could look like to implement this into any kind of co-located clinic. Does that be addiction mess? It could be primary care or whatever, wherever you're practicing, an HIV clinic, whatever. Um, but you got your, you know, and I, I stole this from Dr. Martinez. He's a guy that runs this clinic called La Bodega out in Buffalo. He presented at ASLD and had a diagram very similar to this I thought was fantastic. So I want to steal all this thunder, but I think it was a, it was a great way of showing how you can kind of kind of do this seamlessly. Um, so you guys are getting a lot of referrals from different places that already know patients are high risk for hep C. So hopefully they're testing and sending. They could send them directly to you for just hepatitis C treatment or for, you know, if it's maybe like a, you know, there's a community clinic that, you know, needs addiction services help plus hep C, they can refer to get both of those things done at your, your center. While they're there, you can, you have someone that's going to kind of own the hepatitis C treatment or, or a couple of people, depending on how how much need there is. Um, so someone there that's gonna kind of own it, you do this opt-out screening. So if they didn't get pre-screened, everyone that's coming through the clinic is gonna be, you know, ensured they get screening at least one, you know, once a year. And then the ability to initiate treatment pretty immediately or rapidly if they come in with positive tests already. You have the ability to do on-site labs, hopefully, and then on-site pharmacy, hopefully too. Um, and that doesn't mean that like pharmacy to, to to fill the hep C drug because that'll probably come from some specialty pharmacy, but to be able to hold their medicine for them, which I think is really like a unique thing that like some of the addiction clinics or other community clinics have is like this pharmacy that can store and hold safely manage someone's medicine. And then, you know, you're providing your other services alongside your hepatitis C treatment. And then what I mean by like pharmacy holding is like, then you have this ability to kind of personalize treatment where you can do minimal, minimal monitoring up to daily dosing with them or whatever. You know, you could, you could hold the medicine, give them a week at a time. You could give them a month at a time, whatever is the best for the patient. If they're like homeless, maybe they want to you know, only get a week at a time and keep it safe. Um, and then if you're really worried about them, you could kind of keep a closer eye on them, have them come in every day to take their pill. And then you can, you know, utilize those guidelines that we talked about to keep treatment as easy as possible for you. And these people are simple. They don't need labs. They don't need all these things. You just kind of put them on cruise control and wait till they're done with treatment. Hopefully they're getting their cure then. And then that follow-up, like we talked about, where it's just yearly PCRs. Um, and if, you know, potentially no follow-up if they don't have any risk for fibrosis or reinfection. So, you know, it, make it sound novel, but it's not really novel. People have been doing this before. You know, this isn't like there's lots of clinics around the country and different places that have like more hep C than us that have been utilizing these models for a while. And uh, Dr. Seaman out in Oregon is one of those patient people that's been a strong advocate for this. Um, and he, he actually, him and uh, Martinez, the guy that is the previous diagram, are going to come on our echo and talk in this coming year. I'll let you guys know when they're going to come on because they're like, national experts and really they're this like they're, it'll be really interesting to hear from them and you guys can ask them all kinds of questions and figure out what they're doing but semen here looks at groups of people getting treated so the blue is people treated in an addiction center like a, in a clinic 
um, but with addiction specialty. And then this is out in the community and at SSP, the red, and then the green is like at an academic hepatology clinic. So this looks bad because it's intention to treat, which means that of the people, they had to finish their SVR labs. And if people were lost to follow up in this group, that was counted as a treatment failure. So really, they didn't necessarily fail treatment because, like I said, if they took it the way they're supposed to, they're almost almost always cured. So when you do a modified intention to treat, so you look at the people in the SSPs that actually took the medicine and then came back for their SVR labs, 88% were cured. And, you know, and similarly, like 100% for like both uh, addiction services clinics and the academic hepatology clinics both at 100%. So I think when you look at this, so I mean, this is pretty telling, I think, strong data to support that you can do hep C treatment for sure and these other sites and they expect really good outcomes. So, and then they, importantly, they noticed that like housing status, recent drug use was not associated with these SVR rates or not. So like using drugs doesn't decrease your risk for a cure. Being unhoused doesn't decrease your risk for being cured. These things were independent. So really, I think compelling, lots of data like this too, that other than his that have, have supported these kind of models of care here and abroad. So I think, you know, I think there's good good cause to say that this can be successful. We just need to start implementing it here. Um, this is just my echo quick. Uh, you guys can you know, join up for like hepatitis C talks and like like these you know, these other lectures are coming up that might interest you. I'll keep you guys posted on. I think that's that's it for me. References and yeah, any questions or anything? Well, I, I'll tell you, you make it sound you make it sound pretty simple, but I I think just saying the generic drugs, uh, the way you pulled that off was was pretty amazing. Uh, those are some <laughs> tough words. I would love to ask a question, kind of taking it back to the basics. I think we've all come in contact maybe with a provider that's like GI or infectious disease that says. I am really not comfortable with treating someone until they're outside of the cycle of active use. Do you have any like super sweet, short and to the point phrases that you would say to a provider if they didn't want to treat somebody because they were still using? Like, how do you put that? So it's just a short conversation, but very to the point. Oh, man. Without getting mad. Yeah. <laughs> That's really tough. <laughs> Nothing that makes me more... Uh, I rate than like a specialist that has no clue as to how to handle right? This infection, right? So I would say that's not supported by literature. It, it is well documented that you know treatment with uh, when people are using is highly effective. So we don't want to worry about SVRs going down. And if we are working on a population can like public health and we're trying to decrease prevalence of hepatitis C. To ignore the active drug using population is it like is incongruent with our ability to uh, actively like you know try and eliminate hepatitis C from our populations because that's that's where it's at that's that's this is where the like the biggest volume like where the reservoir of hepatitis C is at so we have to be willing to not be stigmatized patients and and um, treat people equally and that, that group is. It has just as much right to hepatitis C treatment as anyone else. And it's not supported by literature to not treat them. Perfect. You know, there was a question about, um, you know, you must at times get people diagnosed with hepatitis C that have not been screened for SUDs. Is that something that you you always do in the clinic that you're making sure there's not other issues that need to be addressed? Is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very important, like, it, you know, especially for like syphilis, um, you know, we're trying to do do much better within our own our clinics here. I think we do a pretty, pretty good job of like always screening for that stuff. You know, and some of it's easy because it's required for like the treatment. So we're not going to forget like HIV and hepatitis B. But I think um, syphilis is one that we're really focusing more on now and trying to be good about. I don't know about like asymptomatic like if we do like urines for gonorrhea and chlamydia very often, that'd probably be something that would be better. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to get better about prep too, like just like incorpororating that in the practice, I think. Which yeah, is yeah. you know, yeah. Do you um do you do some buprenorphine and stuff as well in your clinic? Do you screen them for the substance use? Um we, we screen for substance use. We I don't prescribe buprenorphine just because we have um well 
our positive care clinic is uh, in our co-located clinic for viral hepatitis is very interconnected with our addiction medicine clinic here. So we kind of like share those patients if they need like those services, we tend to just have them seen next door in addiction, but. Right, did you have another one? Anybody else with the, uh, we did have one other question here. Where'd that go? We got a bunch in the chat. Okay. Somebody asked about prior auths and I know Danielle kind of <laughs> kind of gave their experience. Uh, you know, the, do you think the prior auth is a, is a big, is a big barrier? I think it can be a huge barrier for many reasons. There's just the fact that it takes a lot of time. So you have to have like staff that's able to, you know, dedicate like a, you know, a good 30 minutes or more per prior auth. If I go, if it's a simple one, you know, and then if it has any problems, it could be, you know, hours of work for it right now. So that can be a huge problem for, for community clinics that don't have like a farm revenue team like I do, or I can just like order the medicine and it magically the pharmacy like takes care of everything else for me so it's like a huge bonus like for us but like smaller clinics don't have that kind of stuff necessarily so that's a big problem um i think some of the parts of the prior auth are frustrating um they make you talk about certain things like it, we, it's good to know what people are using but they want you to like prescribe like a month of needle, like needles for them or like condoms, which are like not effectual for like long-term, like, you know, like harm reduction strategies. And, it, it, and it's like this blanket thing. So if someone's not been using for six months and they're doing great, I still have to like talk to them about these things, like, and like offer them needles, which is like counterproductive in some ways, right? I mean, I don't feel very good about like, Telling someone they should, you know, I'm just going to send them in a prescription for for needles, even though they're doing well with like staying staying away from drugs for now. But um, and they have like they have rules around treating acute infection, which is really problematic because um, acute infection is you never you're never going to have a virus viral load as high as you ever will uh, when you're acutely infected. So you're the most infectious at that time. So it, it's great that you might clear five months from now, but in that time period, you may infect four to five more people with hepatitis C that we could have prevented if we would have treated you at the time. So I think that, you know, as far as pub, you know, like this public health and like having, and then having to wait six months, people fall out of care, you know, like yeah, someone that's interested in treatment right now, but six months later, they're lost to follow up and you, and you lose your opportunity to treat them. Um, and then there's things around like cirrhosis, which I think, you know, it's okay to like, you know, to, I, I think that, you know, the people that have been prior treated and the people that have, have cirrhosis require like specialty um, referral right now for care, which I think is not, not effectual. It's not as big of a deal, but I think we, 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 um, we expect like primary care providers to be able to decide when something is too complex for them and refer them to specialists for all kinds of things that are much more complicated than hepatitis C right now. Say like, I don't know, you know, some rheumatoid arthritis or some other things that they can treat in clinic that are really much more challenging that they can just do, you know, they decide when they want to do the referral. I think we can, we can expect that primary care can do the same for hep C. And they shouldn't have to go through a prior auth procedure just to make sure that they're we're getting the correct person treating someone. You know, I think that's just a needless step. We can we can expect people to know when they when and when they're not comfortable to treat something. What's uh, what's your what's your experience with the addiction clinics screening for it and and then referring them to you? Is that is that one of your main referral bases? It's a big one for sure. Um, I think that it could be a lot better though. I don't know, like um, there, I, there's. There's not a, I, I guess I wouldn't say there's a lot of referrals that are coming from like the, some of the treatment centers around the cities here that are coming to us. There's certain ones that do a really good job. Like I see a lot of teen challenge patients and new way patients and some of the, some groups do like a really good job, but I, there's a lot of other places. I think that hopefully they're sending them to other institutions to get treatment, but I'm not sure like how, how well they're linking people to care. How about your jail? Do you get a lot of referrals from the jail? 
I wish. I mean, the jail, like I know the jail people well, and they um, try, and uh, it's just hard because they can't treat while they're in jail. You know, so like if they have like really advanced disease, sometimes we can get them going. Um, but they've been pretty, they're pretty good about trying to offer screening when people come in now, through at least through Hennepin County jails. And then they'll uh, do their best to link them to care afterwards after they're released. And we have a partnership with uh, one of the nurse practitioners, Chantel Erickson, out of the workhouse, who does a good job of like screening and then linking, trying to link to care with us after they get out at least. So we're building those partnerships. I wish it was like, you know, more, we get a lot of no show, you know, from those follow ups. So it's just kind of to be expected. But I, so I wish we could do better about getting them in, but yeah, we're trying. <laughs> In our rural program, we really tried to sort of put together a mini quality project. And as the nurse and then Katie, our program coordinator, we would keep a spreadsheet and just kind of keep track of which patients have been screened for STIs, HIV, and, you know, HEP made a goal of getting all of those things done. And obviously there are challenges with that because some patients kind of come in and out of the program again. But we tried to make a point of at least looking at those things and then putting it in the appointment notes for their visit that they need this thing, this thing, and this thing, just to kind of keep yeah. us organized. <laughs> That's great. I mean, do you find it's kind of interesting because I think that a lot of times I'll see patients that have gone for, you know, annual screening and they get, you know, STI screening but they get HIV, they get syphilis, they don't get a hep C. I've seen that so many times. Um, and is that something that you think happens commonly that people just don't understand that's the other one we want to always add on? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's still, I mean, I mean, hep C kind of did it to themselves, like our, our hepatologists did, because for many years before the new drugs, we were like, didn't recommend screening, you know, routinely and like, and then we were only recommending screening for baby boomers. And now we're recommending screening for everyone. And like we've we've changed like how we decided who should be tested so many times. I think there's so many pitfalls for people to not be up to date on what, what we think is important, you know, for screening. Because um, so I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around how when to screen, how often to screen, like, you know, and uh, and uh, who deserves treatment or how we want to, how, you know, who, who should be getting access to treatment. There's still, like we were talking earlier, people that think that, you know, if you're using drugs or drinking alcohol, you shouldn't be, uh, you know, treated for your hep C until you're not doing those things anymore. And that's just so, you know, so much yeah. dis disinformation out there or inaccurate information, I should say. I especially liked your diagram showing all the areas of healthcare that sort of touch HEP management. And I think that's huge because working in healthcare, you don't realize how siloed you truly are and how much better of a job you could be doing at communicating. So I thought those were just excellent resources to have to just think outside the box a bit. And... Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we just, I met with Clinic 555 this morning before for our talk and uh, was you know, they're the Ramsey County, like public health group. I didn't know much about them. I mean, they're treating hep C, they're doing, you know, so just even like not knowing what certain people are doing. And you, if we know what everyone's doing, we can like help, you know, bring patients to these, to where they need to be. If we only know what people are doing, you know, so much is happening. I think Ramsey County provides their correctional health care as well. So that's probably mm -hmm. huge to communicate with them. All right. Any other questions before we let Jesse go? I think that was fabulous. And please look up his echo if you have an interest in doing this. I yeah. I'll keep you guys posted on um, some of these talks that might be interesting to you, too, that are coming through our echo that kind of on this intersection with addiction and, and hepatitis C that might yeah. be helpful. For yeah. You. Please let us know. We're happy to post them. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank All you. Right. Take All care. Right. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. We will see you in a few weeks. Because yeah. Enjoy the holidays. Yeah, enjoy the holidays. <laughs>